Hi, this is Teddy, and today you're listening to healthcare advocate Laura Packard on Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast Podcast Network. Stay home and save lives. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast family of podcasts. And I am on today with Laura Packard. Laura is a cancer survivor, the founder of Healthcare Voices, uh, and also a small business owner. So hi, Laura. Hello. So thank you for, for joining me today. I think healthcare is obviously is and has been a really important topic uh, in politics for uh well, forever, but for many years now, certainly in the U.S. Uh, so I, I think it's important to, that we talk about this was important before the pandemic, but especially is is really important now. So I, I wonder if you could start by uh, just telling us a little bit about your your story, your uh, diagnosis and recovery from cancer, uh, and then you know uh, how that led to you uh, founding the the Healthcare Voices. Sure. Uh, well, a uh, little over three years ago now, I walked into a doctor's office with a nagging cough and walked out with a stage four cancer diagnosis. That was a lot to process. <laughs> but this all happened in the spring of 2017, which was the same time that the uh, Republican attacks on our health care were ramping up. In fact, the day after my first chemotherapy appointment in May was the day that Republicans in the House voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And since the Affordable Care Act was what was keeping me alive, I was very invested in that fight. And uh, today, uh, Sunday, actually, is the... The anniversary, three years ago, my senator at the time, Senator Heller, put forth yet another bill to strip away health care from millions of Americans and hundreds of thousands of Nevadans, including myself. So I had spent all of 2017 lobbying my senator, Senator Heller, to do the right thing to stand up for Nevadans and stop these repeal attempts. And instead... Today, three years ago, he turned around and introduced a bill with his own name on it to do that. I had read that you were had also been thrown out of was it Senator Heller's town hall (laughs) as well? Can can you tell me what what happened? (laughs) Sure. So um, this all happened in September of 2017, and then in December, I finally had the opportunity to meet my senator face to face because he was not coming to Nevada very often. (laughs) So um, I was a part of protests outside of closed door uh, high dollar fundraisers he held, but he never did anything public in the entire state all year until this one event that I found out about. So I registered for it. I showed up. I uh, He uh, pulled my question out of the list of questions. And then when I stood up to ask it, I was escorted out. (laughs) And what was the question that you asked that got you escorted out? (laughs) Well, um, as a small business owner, I wanted him to talk about uh, his healthcare votes and uh, why he was stripping away healthcare from people like me. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't really have a good answer to that question. But today in 2020, he is no longer a U.S. senator. So uh, three years ago, uh, the four of them, which was Senator Heller, Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, uh, Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, and Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin came together. Uh, Now, all of the U.S. senators at some point or another were a part of 
terrible, all the Republicans uh, were part of terrible attempts to strip away uh, the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. Or in some cases, like Susan Collins, she pretends to care about health care and then she votes for Brett Kavanaugh. So uh, like they're they're all in it. It's just a matter of degree. But those four that I talked about four years ago put forth uh, their own bill. And this year, people in South Carolina and in Louisiana have the opportunity to show what they think about that. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Uh, And uh, I very much hope that like Senator Heller, they are ex-senators soon. (laughs) (laughs) Then tell me about uh, Healthcare Voices and and what this organization is and, and what you do. Sure. Uh, well, uh, after I got through 2017, so I was in remission and uh, I'm, I'm doing great. And uh, so I wanted to organize people like me to be able to help tell their own stories because in all of these healthcare fights, the people that are listened to are the people with money and power and not the people directly on the front lines. Uh, so I wanted to give other people the opportunity that I had to speak up and have my story heard. And so a couple of years ago, I started this nonprofit and, um, Monday night, uh, September 14th, um, we're holding a training on a free training online on Facebook live and also uh, on YouTube for people with healthcare stories to get some media training on how to tell their story most effectively. So I think this podcast will be released after that, but the training will be available um, on the Facebook page and on the YouTube channel to watch anytime. Excellent. And this is what you were already doing, right? Before all of this, you the, this is uh, you in your background uh, doing things like uh, media training and, and helping nonprofits, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm a small business owner and I've been working with nonprofits doing social media and email fundraising, that kind of thing for the last decade or so. Uh, and actually in 2009, um, the AFL-CIO sent me to Arkansas. Saw uh, to help get uh, healthcare reform passed in the first place. And at the time, I had no idea that it would save my life a decade later. So, you know, I've been in this world a while and just I was helping other people, never realizing that eventually it was going to happen to me. Why, uh, why focus on storytelling? What, you know, what is uh, sort of the, the power in politics of something like having people tell their personal stories? Well, I think as Democrats, we love facts and figures. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we love reality, but uh, facts are not the best way to change somebody's mind. Uh, people, you can see people that have major changes in their philosophical beliefs. It's usually because of somebody close to them or somebody they know breaks through by telling their personal story. So we can do facts and figures and reports all day long, but that doesn't change anybody's opinion at the end of the day. Not really. Um, So Telling our stories is the reason why we were able to stop the repeals a few years ago. Uh, It came down to one vote. It came down to Senator McCain uh, in the Senate. Uh, And I really believe it was our stories that broke through. And so if we want to move forward on, you know, expanding healthcare to everybody or lowering prescription drugs on all of this stuff, there are people with a lot of money that are very invested in things not changing. And so the only way we get change is uh, to make it impossible for them to stand in our way. And how we do that is facts and figures don't move elected officials or, or everyday people, but our stories do. Is there something in particular you have found is especially effective in, in telling these stories? You know, are there, I, I don't want to make it sound crass, but like strategies, techniques, things, uh, or is it just the, the sort of power of the, the story itself? Like what, what's important in, in what people are conveying? Well, you should absolutely attend our training. And find yes. Out. Yes. <laughs> But I think um, you have to get to the meat of it. 
uh, it, sometimes people can take a while to work their way to the point. So at least if you're if you're writing a good email, often you'll, you'll draft an email and then you'll just chop out the first paragraph, the first two paragraphs. Like as humans, we tend to take a while to get to the point, mm. and I'm probably taking a while to get to my point here. <laughs> that was straight. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so I think thinking about what you want to say ahead of time and practicing and figuring out what are the most important elements, uh, because once the spotlight is on you, uh, you know, if you don't have notes, if you haven't thought things through, you know, you'll always think about afterwards, oh, I should have said this, or I should have done this. And that's why preparing and really thinking through the things you want to uh, get across, will really help you. And in any sort of interview, like you're probably going to ask me at the end of this interview, uh, is there something you'd like to add? You know, reporters <laughs> always ask you that. Yeah. And just making sure that you, 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 you write down a few points, you know, like you don't have to write down an entire speech unless that's how you like to do things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, writing down the points that you want to convey and then if uh, they don't quite get there during the interview, making sure that you have that chance at the end to say the thing you wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's good advice. Uh, and definitely people should <laughs> check out the training to, to get more uh, in-depth advice. Uh, you got to tell your story to Joe Biden too, uh, as part of the, <laughs> the Democratic National Convention. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? It was such a unique convention this year. Uh, and it was so great to to be able to hear stories from real people. Yeah. And uh, so I watched um, almost all the Democratic convention. I, wa also, I watched all the Republican convention because I hate myself. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I kind of got to see the contrast. And mm -hmm. I think that everybody understands that real people's stories are more interesting and compelling than an elected official, given their speech that they always give, you know, because uh, both conventions really did feature people with uh stories. I mean, I think some of their stories were maybe not fully connected to reality, but <laughs> <laughs> moving along, uh, you know, I think stories are critical. And filming the Democratic National Convention itself was very strange. Uh, they shipped us uh, the um, equipment so it was all sort of like a rental rental deal. I think they arranged, they didn't, they didn't, they rented stuff. So, you know, get this box of stuff that shows up at your door with detailed instructions on how to set it up. And then uh, sitting in my uh, spare bedroom, looking at Joe Biden on a little phone. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, uh, so that was uh, strange. But um, the segment in the convention itself, I think it was only about five minutes or so with mm -hmm. all of us, but our conversation with him was more like half an hour to an hour. So mm -hmm. there is a lot that did not make it into just the brief clip they showed on TV. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we had a real discussion with him and that was that was pretty great. And it's uh, an interesting conversation, contrast. Right. To, uh, <laughs> uh, Donald Trump blocked me on Twitter a few years ago, so he is not interested in having that conversation. When uh, when you're thinking about this election, about 2020, I mean, I think, you know, we saw in 2018 that healthcare was such an important issue that that was really driving voters to the polls, understandably. Do you think that that is still the issue driving people to the polls in 2020? Uh, I mean, obviously, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, so healthcare is important. Um, but I think maybe it's it's bigger than just the the pandemic. So, do you think that this is still sort of the the top of mind issue for a lot of voters? I think so, and sort of in different ways, because the pandemic really made it clear to me, at least, that we're all in this together. If you don't have health care, that directly affects me during a pandemic, but just in general, that we need to make sure that everybody is covered, because uh, if people aren't covered, this pandemic is just going to keep circulating and spreading, and, you know, everybody, both intrinsically as a human right, everybody deserves health care. But even in a completely selfish way, you having health care protects me. So I think that uh, more people that maybe were not philosophically inclined to believe that everybody should have health care, at least now see the point in how they are endangered by other people not having health care. But I think right now we're, we're in such uncertain times. Uh, my sister is now unemployed. She lost her job. Uh, well, she was furloughed and then it was 
final a month or so ago. So, you know, her health insurance is running out and she has to figure out what to do. And that is millions upon millions of Americans that thought they were secure. They thought they had a job and they had health insurance. And, and now they're realizing that all of us could lose, you know, our health insurance at any moment. And uh, we need to make sure that we're covered. In addition to everything else going on with the pandemic, you know, anybody could get sick at any time and you could wind up in a hospital on a, on, on a ventilator. And this administration's mismanagement of everything from start to finish, uh, not only was he lying um, months ago, he, Trump knew that this was serious, but it would be one thing if he was trying to reassure Americans and then working feverishly behind the scenes to do all of the work that they needed to do to prepare for this, but they weren't. So not only was Trump lying to the Americans about the severity of this pandemic, instead of making sure that we had PPE and we had testing and tracing ready to go, he was fucking golfing. Yeah. Yeah. It's horrifying. So if, People want to uh, to get involved with this, to tell their stories, uh, and and to make sure that we are voting for people who will protect healthcare and not take it away. Uh, what are some ways that they can get involved uh, in the work that you're doing? Well, uh, first of all, check out Healthcare Voices on social media or our website, healthcarevoices.org, and sign up. Uh, second, I think it's really important to get plugged into local groups because even if you are in the reddest, most conservative state, there is still legislation that's being passed on the state level. There's still things you can do locally that will make a difference for your friends, your neighbors, and even yourself. In recently, several red states like Nebraska and so on voted to expand Medicaid because people recognize that everybody needs health care. Republican elected officials may not recognize that, but the people do. So every time it's been on the ballot, it's passed. In liberal areas, in conservative areas, people vote for it. And so if you live in a state that's not moving forward on health care, maybe there are options like a ballot initiative or uh, other things that you can do still to push forward on this. Yeah. And of course, these elected officials have health care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, in in terms of obviously the presidential race is, is the one that everyone's thinking about and obviously is very, very important. Are there other races around the country right now uh, that you think people should be thinking about in terms of, of health care and, and being able to sort of change that, that dynamic? Uh, well, if you live in a state with a Republican governor, pay close attention because I know um, Missouri – uh, Missouri has not expanded Medicaid and the governorship is on the line this year. So that is an opportunity to, to change the whole climate in Missouri from top to bottom is vote for somebody that values health care. And uh, if we want to be able to do anything next year, anything positive, as opposed to always trying to stop these attacks in our health care, we have to make sure that Mitch McConnell is not running the Senate. We have to flip the Senate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And so the uh, the sort of obvious targets in the Senate are Colorado, Arizona, Maine. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's just a, a really broad Senate map that the Democrats could uh, could be targeting this year. I mean, states like South Carolina replacing Lindsey Graham uh, with mm -hmm. Jamie Harrison would be amazing. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think everyone should pick a Senate race and really focus uh, a lot of energy there. Yes. So Colorado, Arizona, Maine, North Carolina, Iowa, Montana, and then ones that are going to be harder, but, uh, you know, Texas and South Carolina and Alaska. I mean, there are so many places where people can make a difference. Uh, and if you have a story and you're willing to share it, you should absolutely get out there and find other groups you can work with to help share your story. And since you already uh, predicted, I would ask this question: Is there anything else? <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to make sure that that we talk about today? Uh, just that uh, if people want to do more on healthcare, go to healthcarevoices.org and sign up. 
and uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want the to see the Twitter feed that's too hot for Donald Trump. <laughs> L Packard on Twitter. Excellent. Uh, and I'll put links uh, to Healthcare Voices and, and to your Twitter account on our uh, website so that people can find those as well. Uh, so Laura, thank you so much uh, for speaking with me today. I think your story is is really inspirational, but it's also really, uh, it, it's practical, you know, that, that we have this advice that, that telling stories can really move the needle. And so I think that's that's so important for people to be thinking about. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I am probably former Senator Dean Heller's least favorite constituent. (laughs) And I am hoping that someday former Senator Cory Gardner will also flinch when he hears my name. I hope so, too. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Thank you, Laura. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at Two Broads Talking Politics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.